Hello, that's me, that's who I am, that's what I'm talking about. I genuinely did my PhD in 3D printing shape-changing jelly, and if you pay tax in the UK, you paid for some of that, and I am very grateful, thank you. <laughs> Yay! Socialism! Um, so, uh, I prefer to be known as Scary, my pronouns are they, them. I have a legal name and that is what is required if you want to give me money or look at my academic publications, which is why it's up there. I've realised that if I stride around, then I cannot hit the next button, which is a bit of a failure mode, I have to say. Um, so, the thing people always ask is, um, why? <laughs> So, uh, much like the, the, the last speaker, I'm going to assume a few things as, axi as axiomatic. 3D printing is by default good. We can debate this, and I certainly did not agree with that by the end of my PhD, but that's what I believed at the start. Um, one thing you can say for it is that it lets you make lots of different shapes with one piece of equipment. You can't argue about that bit. Uh, the rest of it? Mm. Um, Shape-changing things, they're pretty awesome. So, I don't know how much you know about pine cones. Um, I refer you to my previous talks at EMF about shape-changing materials and how they are awesome. But pine cones can, they know when it's wet, they close to protect their seeds, they know when it's dry, they open to disperse them. They keep working, they've dug pine cones out of million-year-old coal seams, and they keep moving. You can break half of the bits off and the rest that's left, just works. They don't require a power supply. They are not vulnerable to hackers from any geopolitical area. <laughs> I could do with some of, I would like maybe 1% of our tech to be as reliable as a pine cone. So I got a bit over being outdone by a bloody tree. And that's why I decided to spend four years of my life in a lab. Um, there is more on this at my previous talk. Uh, so there are people doing shape-changing materials that you 3D print. They're awesome. They have a lot more money than I do. And uh, I learned that the lab at MIT where they do this, their machines are half a million quid, and uh, they have two dedicated technicians to look after them. And their work is beautiful, and I admit it's more beautiful than mine. And it's, it's, it's more photogenic than mine, and it's more reproducible than mine. But mine cost me 750 pounds. So if you normalize it and ignore the cost of my labor, <laughs> it vaguely works. Um, and a final point, which is an interesting meta point that probably people who know more about history and philosophy than me can say, but historically we've done some kinds of engineering more than others. We do a lot of work with bricks, we do a lot of work with metal, we do a lot of work, a little bit of work with wood, less now, less on tensegrity, more on compression. And uh, we've done a lot less with soft materials which is weird because like, we are entirely soft materials and we interact with a lot of the things we use. So there's this big gap of people know less about working with rubber, people know less about working with gels. That's why jelly. So 3D printing cool shapes, responsive things, pine cones are defying me, and um, soft materials, jelly, because a lot of the people who do this work with those very expensive machines and those use proprietary plastics which a, I resent having to pay for, and B, I am too bad a chemist to be trusted to make. So I'm about good enough to cook, and that's why I do what I do. So, <laughs> uh, so this is where I started, open source 3D printer, um, Rostock Mini, because Delta printers are cool. Again, we take this as axiomatic. Um, I modified this to have a nozzle head and a syringe extruder. This is actually V1, it got updated. You see it in action here because I had to submit it in PDF, so no videos. Um, the sort of materials I'm using are a jelly. Uh, you will know if you've made jelly that it starts off as a liquid and then you have to set it into a sort of more solid structure. I can bore you endlessly about the technical differences between those, but as long as you know that it is runny and then it is not runny, that is the important bit. And uh, the way that you make this special heat-sensitive jelly um, into not runny needs to be runny to go through the needle and then not runny to put the next layer on top. And you do the not runny by putting some LEDs on top. So there's a really helpful company in Shenzhen who helped sort that out for me for very little um, compared to what it would have cost me in this country. So I bolted that on, cut up an old heat sink. It's an incredibly lossy system. Um, put a syringe extruder on the top and whacked it in a, a fridge that used to hold drinks that I bought secondhand on eBay. 
and uh, that's what you need to make this particular kind of shape-changing jelly. I can again bore you about how this jelly changes shape, but if you understand that jelly is mainly water, and what's uh, not water is like a network of uh, long, thin molecules, like cheese strings, but with less nutritional value, and um, even less. And uh, the cool thing about this is that when the environment around them gets hotter, they shrink up, and then they kick out all the water that's in them. So think about a jelly where you've taken all the water out, well, that's going to be a lot smaller. And that's how this tech works. But if it all got smaller at the same rate, that would be the world's most boring shape-changing item, right? Because it just into a slightly smaller thing. What you want is two layers, one that gets a lot smaller and one that gets not much smaller, and then you can start folding and making sheets and stuff like that. So you use the UV to make it not runny, and you squeeze the runny stuff through, and then the UV, you set it into shape, and you get this jelly that changes shape when uh, it goes into something hot. So these, it's a rule that whenever you're doing uh, science, you start with the simplest uh, situation, so one-dimensional beam. 3D print a thin jelly, and 3D print a thick jelly, that's one thing I changed. And on the left is what they look like when they're cold, on the right is what they look like when they're hot. So these are the same samples, and you will note that they look different. <laughs> they, they are white here because they've chucked out all the water, so what's left is opaque rather than transparent. And the interesting thing is that it's, uh, it's kind of curving up in a funky way, which is kind of cool. And the weird thing is that some of them bend one way and some of them bend the other. And I don't know why. <laughs> and neither does science. And I can't figure out how to publish it because none of this is replicable. So <laughs> I swear to you it happens. I swear to you I did it. I swear to you I did not fabricate it. Nobody can explain it, but it's a really interesting technology because all you need to make them uh, fold different ways is to shine light on them from different directions and make them different thicknesses, which is, again, really controllable. So you've got your 3D printer, which can make stuff in any shape. Then you've got two extra degrees of freedom, no, one, where, like, where you've shone the light on them, which way they bend when they, get, uh, when they go into hot water. So... There is another requirement when you're working in soft robotics, you have to make a gripper. Oh yeah, technically this constitutes soft robotics because the bar for robots is very low. If, if it does something in response to an environment, it's a robot, so I'll claim it. So, uh, jelly robot, sort of. <laughs> so, 3D printed flour. So, uh, start off in cold water, that's top left. Put it in hot water and it goes shlunk. Um, I, I don't really know what this is for, to be honest. Um, it, it, it could be like something uh, that we... Could be like an egg cup that auto-deploys. Could be something that we put on the seabed that, you know, as the ocean gradually warms, can give any sea life just a little reassuring hug. <laughs> could be something that we use for meditation, you know? Meditation's very in right now. For the future generations, when we've wiped out all the trees, we can show them this is what pine cones used to move like. Anyway, answers on the postcard for what the point of this is, but there you go, 3D printed jelly that when you uh, put it in hot water closes up. If you would like more on this, and I have no idea where I'm on the timing. Lovely, oh, I'm on time and all this and on time. Um, here is a three minute video of me at the Royal Institution talking about it. Um, I put up a video of the machine working so you can see that absolute strings and wishing that hold together a, a, a responsive jelly printer built on 750 quid by me in a broom cupboard with a sign on the door saying, all hope abandon ye who printer here. Uh, my thesis, if you want all the gory details, um, I'm on Twitter for questions. Um, I do stand-up comedy about science as well as being a scientist. Uh, if you're interested in what you do after doing a uh, PhD in 3D printing jelly that changes shape when it gets hot, uh, the answer is I, I consult on recyclable packaging and uh, also on food science. Uh, vegan food is my favorite thing. So yeah, like weird, weird polymer structures, edible and non-edible is my two branches. Um, uh, yeah, so you, you can like see me do other things. Um, and I'm trying to write this into a paper and I'm trying to document it really nicely because I would love to contribute this to the open source network because my major bugbear with these million pound beautiful systems they have at MIT is Nobody else can do what they do because nobody else has the money <laughs> and they don't share the designs. So um, all of this is built on things that are publicly available. I haven't documented it very well because 
please stop paying me to do that. <laughs> I will be working on that, and if you're interested, I can let you know when that comes out. Thank you so much for being around for questions. I brought a fan club. It was not intended. Um, so my name is Serena. Um, and uh, I handed in this proposal about 36 hours ago, so that's not slides, because I didn't do slides, because that I didn't bring my laptop. That's actually, um, yeah, let's start from the beginning. That's um, the publicly available distillation of my, of my master's thesis. Um, Mm, the idea of my master's thesis was to develop a set, set of recommendations on how to make research in HCI mostly more inclusionary. Um, it started out with a focus on gender, but um, that's because it was funded partially by a Horizon 2020 uh, project, and that only focused on gender, and I opened it up more widely because there's a lot more things that uh, cause discrimination and exclusion than only gender. Uh, the recommendations are available on a website. You can uh, look at them and there's also this PDF that you can print out. Uh, and I basically looked at what HCI publications from well-known venues uh, did good or could have done better in documenting their research, in conducting their research, in the methods that they used, uh, and drew recommendations from that. It's 15 by now, um, and it's actually some of them are no-brainers, but you need to take the time to think about the, th the stuff that you're doing and how you're doing it and why you're doing it the way that you're doing it. And very often, people don't have the time to do that, or in science, technology, engineering, and maths, where I come from, uh, you don't get the education to do that, at least in Austria, where I come from. Um, so it helps to have some recommendations and some information on what you should be thinking about in order to know what you should be thinking about, right? That's two of the cards. They all look the same, they have these icons on top, they have a short title, they have a couple of questions that you can think about yourself or discuss with your uh, team members. There's uh, explanations and examples that you can follow, that you can, again, discuss with other people. And I put up footnotes. <laughs> That's because Again, the assumption was that the target group is tech people who do not know shit about sociology. <laughs> Drawing from my own experience. Um, so that if you sit together with your other techie people and no one knows shit about stuff, but you're usually bullying each other because you're tech people and we're a toxic community. Um, you don't have to ask someone who's holding the description of the, whole, uh, of the whole card deck if you don't understand a word. Instead, it's there on the card that you're holding in your hand, and you can look up the, the, the definition of the word yourself. And I try to keep it in understandable terms, sometimes hard, because English is not my first language, and sociology is complex. Uh, what else is there? The, uh, the color of the title bars actually indicates a uh, somehow position in the project life cycle. So we start with uh, stuff like acquiring funding, um, conducting research. I put that up earlier, I forgot it. I've been talking about this for three and a half years and I still stumble ab across some things. Um, and the icons on top are like thematic groupings so that you can see that some things might be happening in different phases of, the la of, of a project, but they are still somehow connected to each other. 
Sure. How am I with the time? Lots of time still? Lots of time. Um, I'm going to have my defense in three weeks. And uh, one of the questions that is probably coming up, and some of you might be asking yourselves, is why is this even important? And it's important because, uh, one, we have a lot of um, exclusionary stuff happening. We have a lot of tech that is not developed uh, to work for many people, but just for a few who are usually white, cis-het males, able-bodied, and so on. Um, and it's really hard to think outside of your own area. So if you're a tech person, you're going to be in a very homogenous uh, surrounding, and it's hard to think about the issues other people might have. So that's why they are here. Second is there's actually a scientific issue, because if you look at research, there's often uh, not a lot of information, for example, on uh, assumptions they made. I looked at quite some research uh, that was tagged as gender research, and nearly none of them talk about how they operationalize gender. So what do they mean when they talk about gender? Do they mean biology? Do they mean, like, do they literally mean distribution of fat on your body? Because that's not gender. <laughs> but they call it gender. Um, and that's one of the things that needs to be done in order to make research better reproducible issue that we had before. Um, and, the, and the third thing is that I hate injustice. And um, I just figured I could make a, a difference with that work. And I hope that it gets spread a bit. And that's also a reason why I showed up here. And there's the link to the website where you can find it. It's really not pretty, because <laughs> I'm not a web developer. <laughs> Um, and you can look at the cards, you can download the whole PDF. Uh, you can, there's a drawing stack, is what I called it. So you can draw a random card, you can refresh and draw another random card, you can go back to uh, the, the info page. And it's available in German and in English, if you're so inclined to use German. Right, that's that. I'll be here for questions, thanks.